Hi everyone, I'm so happy that you're here to join me for the Way of the Animal podcast. So we've got our coffees, we're ready to go. <laughs> and I think you, Alistair, had today's topic. I do, I, I don't know how to word it into a topic, but it's about, I don't know, I think I'd use the word conscientious, but um, to try and describe it, it's that sort of idea of, especially I see it a lot at work and in workplaces, um, but it re- ripples into the rest of your life as well. But it's that idea of just like doing that extra little bit, seeing issues and dealing with them and thinking about how it affects others, how it affects yourself, um, and not just sort of doing the bare minimum, being a bit more responsible and a bit more proactive, I guess. I don't know. Does that make any kind of sense? Yeah. (laughs) And I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I see a lot of, like, we talk about a lot since we moved from the UK to Canada, the supermarkets, the standard of what's acceptable in a supermarket from the staff and things like that with regards to the shelves and the produce that's on the shelves is it's not even on the same page as the UK. Like you just, a supermarket that ran at the standards of a Canadian supermarket in the UK, no one would shop there and it would be shut down. Yeah. It's not just that the staff were, you know, because... And we're fortunate because we actually worked for a couple of different supermarkets in the UK when we were in college. I don't know if it's fortunate working for the supermarkets or not. (laughs) It was definitely not our cup of tea, but, you know, it's You get to see that world. Yeah, so we got to see the ins and outs of it. And they have very strong managerial structures within the supermarkets in the UK. And um, they um, enforce and they also encourage the workforce to create the right sort of place for people to shop. So they, you know, they're, they encourage you to have shelf stocks, no, no gaps. And it's, and it's, you know, it was like the end of the world. If the manager came around and saw that you had stock and it wasn't on the shelf and there was a gap in the stock, like that was big problems. Even if the shelf was in disarray. Yeah. You know, yep. things weren't straight, things weren't... And, and clean. And clean. Oh, my God. Yeah, but that's that's one of these things. And I wonder, well, I was going to say, well, maybe it's because in the UK, things are so much more close together. There's a lot more competition. It's a lot easier just to go to the other supermarket because this one's rubbish. But here where we are in Canada, there's one, two... There's a, there, like there's you can't like, count. There's a lot. You there's just, a lot of supermarkets. In one town. In one town that's got maybe... 70, 80,000 people in it. There's a lot of supermarkets. So, so it's, it's not yeah. competition. And it's really funny. It's really, the supermarkets are really good one for us because like I said, we work for them. And then going in and shopping and having the experience of being the shopper over here, it was like, you just could, you, you, you would not get away with it. If you worked there, you'd not get away with it. I mean, I've walked in first thing in the morning to a store and they have blocked a lot of the aisles, a lot of the produce with their, um, you know, pallets of produce yep. that they're putting out. Yeah. Which we weren't allowed to do. You could have one or two carts, but it had to be sensibly placed and you had to be able to move it. But it was literally like, it's everywhere. You can't move. You can't get the trolleys around it. That would have been a big no-no. <laughs> and so here's the thing. It's like, you think, well, you know, those people doing minimum wage job, Bottom, the sh- you know, you are the shelf stacker. You don't really care about it, and I don't feel like you need to really. Care. If you've got that job, it's great if you're passionate about it. But I can understand not being passionate about it. But to just like settle for that really low standard, but then it goes up to the managers. Not, you know, they're willing to settle for that mediocrity, or yeah. So it's like you can't blame the shelf stackers. If they haven't been told or like yeah. what is That's expected it. of yeah. them, you know? Yeah, and it's, it's like, this, it's a question that the shelf stackers are like, don't see for themselves. Like, really? Really? Yeah. This is okay? Well, it's just like the standard hasn't been set. This is the, and it's 
something that we always come across, and I'm sure a lot of other people come across as well, is that, oh, this is the way we've always done it. Oh, yeah. But that doesn't always mean it's right yep. as well. You know, that's, that's... That's it. And whether that's, you know, you being conscientious or not, it's that, well, it's always been done like this, so we just do it like this. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, perhaps it's time to change. And it's, it, it's that thing, is that it would take a little bit extra effort to from the managers or the owner or whoever's to change that around. It would take more effort. Yeah. But. Well, I mean, for the supermarket, when it comes down to it, um, you know, the UK are pushing it like they're pushing it because they are trying to maximise profit. So obviously yeah. a gap in a shelf, you um, sell you're not selling something because it's not on the shelf. It's in the store in the back where no one can get it. Rotten produce. Rotten produce. That's going to put people off. They're not going to you know, buy any, you know, yeah. the shelves in disarray, so you can't tell what you're looking at people. You know, it, it affects profitability. So isn't it interesting that it's just not filtering down from above or is their business model just not as developed? Yeah. Or the but, same as the UK. So then, yeah, they're both good points. And I know I've talked about it um, with my boss in other realms, the same sort of, kind of substandard people not putting in the effort that you would expect and i've said well you know back home in the uk this like you wouldn't be allowed to be this lazy about things you would have to put in that extra effort and the comments been a few times you know the close population and that we've had a lot longer as a country than canada to develop these things but i kind of disagree with that one completely because if i started out a store brand new, day one, opening the store, I could choose to have it perfect. Like I could, and I would never get it perfect. No. But I could choose that that's what I'm aiming for. Yeah. Not just that, eh, it's fine. Yeah. It's like you've got a standard. Yeah. Like there is actually a standard. There is a standard. Is it just that there's not a standard? And then so it filters into my work in the idea of that I can't just ignore things. And, you know, it's often to the detriment of my personal time. But it's like, well, no, I this needs to get done. Oh, I passed that. I need to go and pick up that bit of rubbish that's in a field. I need to I need to deal with these things. And But I think I so we're interesting because from a young age we have run our own businesses. So we know like more in depth about what it's like to be in business. Yeah. And we also have learned the lesson of I should have dealt with that then because now it's a bigger problem. Well, we literally just did this the we other day. We did it yesterday. Um, Someone left a gate open, some cows escaped, and there was a field next door to where they escaped from that the gate had been left open. And we'd all seen the gate had been left open in passing. and we must go and shut that. And it would have taken 30 seconds to shut it. We didn't. They escaped from one field, walked through the other field and into the other. F and in reality, it didn't make a huge difference yeah. to us to getting them back in. But we could have avoided a step if instead of just seeing it going, oh, I'll get that next time. Yeah. We just dealt with it. And it would have cost you a minute of time. So, uh, yeah, I think some of it is learning from the mistakes of, oh, you didn't pick up that rubbish and now there's a calf choking on it or has died from eating it. You yeah. know, there's this like, the, we, it's that cause and effect we have started to see, like, you see something, you deal with it then. Yeah. And I also think um, having run our own businesses and just been worked into the ground and working a lot, um, certainly something that I've always strived to do when I'm doing things is trying to figure out the most efficient way of doing it yeah. to save time and effort so yeah. I could got more time for other things. Yes. And I think, you know when you're just doing a job and just doing the job for doing the job, well, it doesn't matter when you finish the task because it's just part of a task. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it's going to mean you won't be able to get on to the next task. Yeah. You know, it's just like... But then you know, it's... Um, if uh, the supermarket's a really easy thing. I mean, it is, it's not a glamorous job. No. But... I know, I, the feeling of coming away from doing a job and feeling like I did a good job there. Yeah. And I don't care whether it's a really menial job or a really glamorous job. 
feeling like I did a good job. So one of the things we've got to do on the ranch here is um, shovel out the bunks. So in the winter, the cows eat out of these big troughs and there always ends up being a little bit left in it and a bit of rubbish and things in the bottom. By rubbish, she means rubbish feed. Rubbish feed, <laughs> yes. Rubbish feed that um, they've not finished up and then it sits there and then it would just rot and go bad. So it has to get cleaned out and thrown out. And it's not a fun job. You're sitting with a shovel in this thing, shoveling out wet grass, basically, that's all kind of rotting down and composting. Um, but doing a good job of it, getting as much of it out as you can, getting it as clean as you can. It's like, I did a good job there. Whipping down it really fast and getting the bulk of it out. Well, you got it done, but when you look at it, it's like, well, that's mess. You know, I'm not happy about that. And I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's the thing that is missing is the looking at the job you've done and going, see, that's not good. It's almost that sense of responsibility for what you're doing. You know, like accountability. pride, accountability. I don't yeah. know. It's just the, I don't know what it is, but I see it lacking and I don't know why. Yeah. I don't know if it's a, you know, generational thing. I don't know if it's, you know, smartphones, instant gratification, um, definitely I mean, out here compared to the UK, leisure time is more important than work time. Whereas the UK, work is very important. Yeah, there's that very strong work ethic, which I don't think is a good thing to me. Well, I, I mean, it's good to have a work ethic, but I don't think... I think we just get so wrapped up in working that we don't actually do the leisure time. Yeah, that's it. You don't want to spend all your life working. But to have a really good work ethic... Yeah, well, I mean, that. I think that's the crux of it, isn't it? It's you, the work ethic. Maybe it's that's wanting what it is. to do a good job yeah. of whatever you're doing. It's like that feeling of accomplishment that you are doing your best at yeah. what you're doing. And that's the thing. Like it, it takes a little bit more effort. But once you can get into the routine of doing it, it doesn't take any more effort at all. And if you have that work ethic, you're set. Like, you don't need anything else. You just need a good work ethic and you will always have a job. And people will learn that you've got a good work ethic and people will want to hire you. But the problem is that they quite often will take an advantage of that yes, as well. Yes, 100% people will take advantage of it, which that gets into the work-life balance issues. Which but then I before. also think that sometimes why people turn off their work ethic. Yeah. Because they've been stung, because they're not getting the gratification yeah the you know the sense of feeling like they're appreciated for the extra work they do it's yeah. just like you're lumped in with everyone else who's doing a mediocre job yeah well i mean that's definitely on the ranch we're on we are trying to do a lot we're trying to bring it standards up improve a lot there's been a long time of mediocre work done and we're trying to turn it around which is a lot of work and can be quite frustrating at times. <clears throat> and I've had the very conversation before that I hope I don't lose my work ethic yeah. and just be like, it's not worth bothering. It's not worth trying. Well, I mean, what I see at the moment is it's you're not losing work ethic, but you're actually losing the joy in the job that you yeah, usually enjoy. Because the frustration comes in. Yeah. Um, so but, it's, it's very interesting, isn't it? That work dynamic of who you're being when you're working and what you're striving for. I like the term work ethic. And like I say, it's the thing, and we get young kids start here all the time. And I try to drum into them a work ethic and try to point out to them things like, I have no concern about job security, not in the slightest. Not only because I'm useful and um, I'm a good asset for the company, but because I have a strong work ethic, people outside of my employers who see me realize that I have a good work ethic. And I know plenty of them that I could phone and say, I'm looking for work. And they would be able to offer me a job because I've got a good work ethic. It was almost like it's few and far between. You know, that, that type of person. Yes. So when they get one, they won't hold on to them. Yeah, definitely. And um, and it's great because it means that some rules don't apply to you as strongly and you get a lot more leniency and you get a lot more respect. You get. A, but you think that, sorry, it's just yeah. come up there. Do you think that 
when you don't put your heart and soul into what you were doing a lot of your time. Yeah. You know, so you're doing your mediocre job. You're not really putting anything into it. Like, do you lose that sense of all sense of it being anything? Yeah. So I, you know, it's like, uh, like, you like know, it's carry a into your thought. personal life. Yeah. Well, it's like that. Yeah. It's like that thought of, well, if you're, you know, say you're nine to five, five days a week, which you aren't, but <laughs> say that's <laughs> what you are. That'd be nice. Um, then, and you you don't like your job, and you're just doing it because you need the money, and you're also just doing like a you don't you're not putting effort into it. You're just going through the motions. Yeah. Let's say just do it, and you're so almost dead to the world with it. Yeah. You know, then you know it must affect how you're feeling and who you are it's when like, you're out of it. Cause I, I, it feels I, like it would affect your soul. I've do, Yeah, I mean, I've done the the working in the supermarket. I yeah. hated it. Like, it killed me. It yeah. was just so bad for me as a place to work. It did not suit who I am at yeah. all. Um, and it was hard. Like, I, I hated it. Yeah. And I hated going, like, I hated going there. And dreading going to work yeah and then you know come home and i have to pick myself up from feeling so rubbish from it so like are the people just having to do what they're doing and hating it and then like it, oh, there's definitely a lot of people out there that don't like their jobs and that's an interesting one because there are jobs that I can understand that you wouldn't like, like stacking shelves or flipping burgers or whatever. I can understand it's not really what you Wait, want to do. I've, I mean, yeah, um, but I've seen people in the supermax just enjoying, enjoying their that job. day. And I mean, obviously it helps with the staff dynamics, you know, the people you're working with. And if you've got a good manager that isn't a complete whatever, <laughs> you know, um, cause there can be ones that are just oh, yeah. not very nice people, but have a place in power. And so they're allowed to just be the way they are. Um, but you know, it does, it's like, it's quite often the people you work with and the environment you work in. And even if you're doing the jobs that are just really like shoveling out the bunks yeah. and we talk about it a lot, a Scottish thing, um, is banter. Yes. And it's something that we've used so many times in the jobs we've done. We would have long days working in the sheep fanks with the sheep all day or working with the cattle all day. And who you work with and the jesting, the fun, the chat, the stories, all that side of it. It's like a social dynamic of... Um, enjoyment whilst you're doing this yeah but and it is, it's almost a menial task you know you're repeating the same thing over and over again yeah with with the animals you know and just um that made it you could come away from that and be like that was a good day or like it was hard work Long but it, day, uh, hard so much work. fun you have a good laugh and there's so many days we've just like got through so much work and it's just been so much fun yeah definitely and that like you say, the banter, the the having fun is a important part, especially when it is a difficult job or yeah. just a long job. Like a like I said, day. with like sheep, you you know, you you've got a thousand sheep and you've got to handle and deal with every single one or the cattle, you know, when they're yeah. getting their pregnancy testing done, you know, every single one has to go through the system. And you know there's like seven hundred to come through and it and it you know it's gonna take all day. And it is reasonably repetitive, other than some animals yeah. behave slightly differently, can be a bit awkward to get in or can get a bit excited. There's like that goes on. But other than that, it's the same thing over and over and over and over again, which I'm sure a lot of people have in different work places. And it's the people that you're with that can make that, make or break that day. Definitely. Definitely. And interestingly, I did hear. Um, Oh, now, who was it that said it? I think it was Stephen King um, talking about writing books and things. And he said, the best thing to do when you're starting out author 
is to get a menial job, sell your labor, don't sell your brain. Yeah. Then when you're doing menial jobs, you can be thinking and the stories you could write in your head while you're doing something that doesn't really take a lot mm -hmm. from you. Um, so I could understand if I... But that's like, it's a means to an end, isn't yeah, it? And, it is. and 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 it, it, some of it is your attitude. Atti and it comes down to, like you've talked about your personal life, it's like your attitude to yourself and to your life. Yeah. Like, so even if you know that the job is just a means to an end, like you need the money. Yeah. Doesn't mean that you, you aren't mentally there when yeah. you do it. Or you can be, like you said with Stephen King, there, but knowing that it's helping you get somewhere else. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you know that you're working on something else. But in all that, the the conscientious, the responsibility, the still trying to do a good job, even though you're not really in it for the job. And I don't know. And, and the, the thing is as well is, you know, it comes down to every individual and their, um, you know, their stories that they've created, the lives they've had, the experiences they've had. You know, if you've got a fear of sense of responsibility, yeah, then when someone's handing over responsibility to you, like that yeah. can be, I, I don't want to be responsible for this, you yeah. know, and, and uh, I'm as good as anyone to go yeah no i'm not responsible for that yeah. i'll do this but i am not responsible for what happens when yeah. we do this you know and then there's even the self-sabotaging and things like that that can come into it there's a mm. lot of mental aspects that can come into it mm. and so like beyond the it seems to be a bit of a trend or a, a way and certainly we seem to keep coming across it and obviously <laughs> that it like the world is complex, so sometimes you can keep attracting the same sort of um, instances in your life. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's noticed that come up. Um, and until you sort of deal with this, your sense of self that seems to attract that sort yeah. of problem within your life, then that won't change. But yeah. I, I, I do believe that it's not just us. No. <laughs> there might, there might, there's other people who are experiencing the same thing, and I think... Certainly, you know, there's a wild labour shortage in Canada, but it yeah. seems to be as well, it's... The standard is just... The, yeah, very it's, low. It's we're happy to accept this low standard. And one that I always use an example, um, when we were back in the UK farming, we used to have to do animal health plans with our vet. Um, and you would go through what your plan was, medicines you would be using, um lambing and calving how many you hope to get in calf or pregnant and um, with the sheep and the cows and how many births you hope to get out of it and there was literally a col column in the sheet that was your aim i said well 100 percent and my fact you can't put 100 percent i was like well why not and he said well you're not going to get 100 percent like well i know i'm not going to get 100 percent, but that's what i would like to get so my aim is 100 percent and we had a huge conversation about it. I said, no, it says aim. I aim for 100%. I'm not aiming for 90%. No, I'm aiming for 100%. And that's the thing. It's You can't make things perfect. This world is not perfect. Nothing will ever be perfect. But it doesn't mean you can't aim for perfect. And if you aim for perfect and you hit 90%, well, you're probably aiming and striving further than everyone else is, rather than someone who's like, well, you know, I think I'm probably only going to get about 60, 70%. So we'll aim for about there. And well, we got 50%. So it's good enough. We were I mean, close. And it also depends like that sort of thing. Goals are hard. <laughs> like, yeah. And that would be a really interesting topic. Is that would be, goals. we should talk about that. So we should talk about that. Um, uh, we'll maybe record that next. But goals can be hard because of the mental influence of not reaching your goal and yeah. and how it, that changes how you feel about it and you know and so perhaps aiming for that 100% can make you feel like well I didn't get the 100% so I've failed whereas you're just like well aim for the 100% and that keeps me like per pers persevering for a higher can always be better yeah that's it and that's definitely right and it's an interesting one because it makes me think of our conversation on accountability no, not accountability, authenticity. That's the word. Yeah. 
authenticity and it's um you have to i i feel to be authentic you have to be okay with the things that you aren't as happy about yourself you know we were sort of talking about that and i think that's the same if you're setting goals there are two different ways to go you set achievable goals and if you're someone who really struggles with beating themselves up i'm not good enough i'm a failure i can never do it then yeah setting yourself achievable goals helps but if you're the sort of person and maybe this is what it is maybe if you're the sort of person that deals with things more like i do it's i prefer to set up a goal that i know i can't reach but i'm going to try as hard as i possibly can to reach it um it's like we go to kickboxing class and one of the circuits we do it's you know one minute for each exercise and one of them's usually push-ups and i know i can't do it. it's little pump push-ups so it's like right down the bottom of the movement and i know i can't do that as fast and as hard as i can for a minute without stopping i can't do that yet yet but every time i go into it i the clock starts and i go down there and i try to go for the minute now usually i get to 30 seconds or a little bit past and I'm really struggling and then even after that it's hard to get going again and it's interesting because our coach always says to pick a number you think you can do and still have some left in the tank do that number take a break do that number take a break that way you're not I think for a mental state I think a lot of people find that easier because you're not failing so maybe that's where it comes from yeah and it's it is great. Like I love the kickboxing class because it's what they call trauma informed. Yeah. So it's a very conscientious coach, um, who hopefully we're going to get in the podcast. Um, but it's really interesting. Um, like, especially for me, you can struggle with things like it's yeah. great how she sets it out. So. So that's the interesting yeah. thing. So then, does that transpire into, into work. work? Yeah. So for me, I like the. I don't think I can probably do this, but I'm going to try and do this. And when I don't manage to get there, I'll be like, well, I nearly got there. Next time I'll get further. Um, Whereas I think for you, you like the, this is a challenge, but I can do it definitely. Yeah. So you're not having that almost knockback. And maybe that's what it's like at work. Mm. Well, I don't want to try at work because if I try and I don't do good or or get it wrong, then it's really hard for me to deal with. Yeah. It's like dealing with disappointing people. Yeah. And then you get into the habit of disappointing people because you start behaving or trying yeah. in a different way because you're just like, well, I can't please them, so I'm just going to do what I'm doing. But then you get that um, freeze, that fear yeah. of movement, that fear of trying to do something because you might fail. And so instead of saying, well, I'll take this little baby step yeah. towards my end goal, and if I do that, that's great. I managed to do that. Okay, I can do that consistently now. I'll take another step and another step, and eventually we will get to the goal. And maybe that's what it is, mm. that that's the lacking bit, that they're just... It's fear. Like, it's, I think it's there's been a lot of fear. Yeah. And, you know, something that I think is a big influence now to people and work ethic is COVID. Yes. And I think because a lot of people were either laid off or couldn't work yeah they've seen what life's like if without work. work yeah and it's like like you said you know sometimes you have that realization that oh work isn't everything yeah. and i think there's now a generational gap there's a whole change in mentality in people because a lot of people struggled without work because it was their structured thing that they thought they needed yeah and covid was almost long enough that people got through that trauma to the point where, like, I don't really want to work yeah. anymore. And now so dynamics see, have changed. That makes me think of, um, it was a podcast, Lex Friedman. No, was it Lex Friedman? Yeah, I think it was Lex Friedman podcast that I was listening to. Anyway, doesn't matter who it was. He was speaking to a neuroscientist, um, doctor, and they were talking about training new students. And he remembers training a few years ago And the problem they had was getting students to stop, getting them to take time off studying, take time off practicing, getting them to get sleep. That was, they had a huge problem. They had to crack down on their students, stop studying, stop working, take some time for yourself. And they just couldn't get them to stop. Nowadays, it's not a problem at all. Motivation. So 
Well, I don't know. Is it motivation? I don't know. It's, yeah. I don't it's know. like getting people to do stuff. Yeah, yeah. now it's to, the other to way. To dedicate themselves. Yeah. yeah. Mm, it's and, inter- I do think, so like we've gone around this whole conversation, but I think COVID is a crux in humanity. Yeah. Like it's something that is opened the world's eyes yeah. to a different way. And for some people, it's changed very little in their lives. But I think to a lot of people, it's like big. It's yeah. really oh, yeah. big. That, that sort of forced stop of the whole of humanity. But the worst thing is we were forced up and fed fear. And yes. I think... It wasn't a healthy stop. No. I think there's still a traumatic recovery period that is happening. Definitely. That some people are struggling to heal from. Yeah. Is dealing with they have excess fear. Yeah. Still stored in them from that time. And, you know, sort of getting back on track in their life and realising that they want their life to be different, yeah. but not knowing, you know, it's like it's a whole new world. Yeah. I mean, there, and, and there's definitely, there's a supply of people who are in positions they don't like, where they're unhappy, but don't know it's okay to not like that and it's okay to change that. Yeah. And, I mean, when it comes down to it, I've always said this, you need money to live. Like, you need money to live. And I will do any job if I have to. Like, I quite happily, I'll stack shelves. Yeah. That's fine. But I couldn't stack shelves. Mediocrely. Mediocrely. I would (laughs) have to do it well. I'd have (laughs) to put the effort in. Well, it's funny because uh, talking about motivation, you know, when I worked at the supermarket, it was I was doing it really well. And then it got to the stage where it felt like the job was suffocating me and then I stopped doing it well. So that's interesting how I went from a person who's very highly motivated and would like to do things well to I just want out of here. Yeah. And actually, I think not long after that, I was just, I'm, I'm done. And yeah. I moved on to something. Or did I go to the... Anyway, but yeah. Yeah. It was just... It just wasn't. But So that's interesting now, thinking about it, and you know, sort of putting myself in that place of having shelf stacking job in one of the supermarkets near us that the standards are really low. Yeah, where there's dust on the produce that isn't selling. There's mouldy produce <laughs> yeah, in amongst yeah. the fret. Like, it's yeah. ridiculous. I would have to deal with all that stuff. Yeah. At the age and place I am in life now, not only would I have to deal with that stuff, I would have to deal with the manager and yeah. explain to the manager how this is not acceptable and we should have a higher standard. At which point I'm kind of doing the manager's job. Yeah. But... I'm comfortable enough in myself that I would have no problem going up to them and saying, "Uh -uh, no, no, this is not acceptable. We need to do better. We need to change. But I think a lot of people come across that. You know, we've actually listened to another podcast um, where the guy was talking about um, he's seeing problems. He's like, you know, if you did it like this, that would solve it. And then managers, you know, higher ups, no, no, no. We're yeah. just going to keep doing uh, that. Higher ups, it? managers especially, do not like you to tell them that they could do it better well, well, when you're just, below them. Well, it's just like, you know, I think he said he worked at Costco, funnily yeah. enough, and he was saying, you realise that you're throwing all those rotisserie chickens out and you know how much that is costing you and how many chickens are dying for no reason. Yeah. Um, and because you're not sorting out the, the you know, the pr- product line of yeah. how much you need and... You know, and it's just, and you know, it it it's crazy, but it is that way. If a lower person sometimes has suggestions, not all managers won't always take it because it's not their place. But I mean, God, they could just take it higher up and just be like, "It was my idea." Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, well, it's just like, here's the thing. But then, but then that really shows you, I think, that it's not just the lower paid people no. that are the issue. It goes all the way up the management tree to the top. Hundred percent. Like, yep. you can't say. Oh well, our lowliest janitor is the problem. Yeah. Because the problem is the CEO yeah. who isn't dealing with the yeah. lowliest janitor's issues. Yeah. And I guarantee you, in every company, in every business, in every country in the world, the lowliest person there has a really Keep good low. idea yeah. that could improve their workday, that would save the company money, improve productivity. Yeah. And all they have to do is ask that person. Yeah. But there's definitely that disconnect. Yeah. So it's, it's a really, I've really enjoyed this topic. It's been really interesting. 
I don't think we've come to any conclusions. There's but no conclusions. We didn't but expect to, but it was really interesting to just because we talk. We actually talk about a lot. I think every time we come out with the supermarket, we were yeah. just just absolutely amazed at how poorly it's done. Yeah. Um. It just is sh- like it's shocking every time, and we've been here two years, but every time it we come out, me. it still shocks me. It, it shocks me. It frustrates me. Yeah. And honestly, it makes me want to go and work there and change yes. it. Well, it's a, it just show it, but it kind of shows you some of the real problems that's yeah. going on in the the world, and it's just simple things like a supermarket. But it like it starts with everything, you yeah, know. It does. It starts yeah. with everything, and I, yeah, I don't think we came to any conclusions. No. I don't think you we're, can we're not come meant to. to. I don't think we were meant to, but it's just a really. It'd be really interesting if anyone else is you know, had those thoughts or, you know, felt that. And and I don't know if people's come across it more in the UK. We just didn't notice it. You know, it's like, but there's definitely a very distinct cultural work ethic difference for us that we've come across just where we are in in Canada. I mean, I don't know if it's just that it's just happens to be we're further away from the main towns like Vancouver yeah, and things maybe. like, you know, we're well, further Well, no, because it was still north. there as well when we went and got yeah. groceries. No, but, you're right. <laughs> but one of the things that I see with it is the, I don't know, it just, like, I don't get why you wouldn't care. I don't yeah, get why yeah. you wouldn't, I don't know. Yeah, but it's, like I said, it's some it can sometimes it could be the higher-ups or just whatever that takes your you're oh god i can't even think of the word but it like i like i said with the supermarket it got i was worked hard and i did a good job and then i and actually I felt, felt i actually felt like the managers were just being a bit over the top with their sense of responsibility and that yeah. kind of i was just like no i'm done like it's not it's yeah. just we're not you know yeah, i got it, into trouble for working a bit slow one day i wasn't feeling great and I was working a bit slow and I got pulled into the manager's office for working too slow. You, I passed you several times and you were still reducing down those products to go on the shelves. And uh, that was the end for me. Yeah. That was like, okay, so you didn't say you slowed down. Are you all right? You know, do you need another break? What's going on? You know, it was a very sense of, then that this is this managerials in charge who don't have the concept. It's like I said, the trauma informed um, kickboxing teacher. It's that empathy, the understanding of why would someone slow down a job that they've worked super hard at? So did they recognise that I worked super hard at it, or is it just yeah. you noticed what I wasn't doing at one stage? You know, that's so that negative bias as well, noticing the problems yep, more exactly. than exactly. So it's like just understanding as well that some people are just not good managers. And just because they don't know how to... They don't know how to deal with yeah. people. It's like there's a whole new wave of conscientiousness in, in that side of things is understanding that if people aren't being productive, well, it may not be the right thing to say, be more productive. It's more like, what's going on in your life? Are you okay? Yeah. Is that, yes. you know? Yeah. And there's other managers that would have done that, but this one obviously wasn't. But at that stage, I just went, yeah, no, uh, no. Nope, not I'm, dealing. No, nope. yeah, I'm done. If that's the way you're going to treat me, I and and I'd had a very difficult workplace when I was quite young, um, where I was treated quite poorly, and it now if anyone treats me like that in a workplace and the last branch yeah. was the same thing, I was like, yeah, no, I'm done. Yeah. I'm sorry, no one treats me like that anymore. That is a line I drew after yeah. that last place, and I don't work for people that treat people like that. But I think that's the thing. You can work harder, um, have higher standard, be more responsible and dedicated to your job without bullying people and being, because if you're, yeah. if you're managed, yeah. so you go into a supermarket here, okay, guys, we want to raise the standards. We want to get these things better. These are the things we're going to need. You don't need to berate the staff. No. You just need to encourage them, encourage and, uh, them. to understand why. Understand and, why. and probably half the problem is if it's anything like, it's, there's, there's a labour shortage, so they're probably just short staffed the whole time probably in the supermarket, and yeah. that's why like you're lucky there's anything on the shelves, you yeah. know. Yeah. But you know, it, like they said, there's always a bigger problem within the smaller. There's problem. always something you're not seeing. Yeah. So, anyway, I think we will call it there. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
good topic. Really interesting. I think it is interesting, yeah. and I don't know if it's a wider thing yeah. that people see or not. It'd be yeah. interesting. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.